Hello everyone and welcome to I think this is our 29th webinar. It's been like almost uh, more than two years now and thank you so much for always being there. I can see so many people who have been there over the years and I thank you every one of you for being there and attending this uh, webinar. So this is a new subject actually. We have been doing quite a few webinars on HIPAA and GDPR and stuff and uh, uh, since most of our, our webinars are on um, requests so to say many people ask it what they're asking for so this webinar has been uh, again many people ask that there is in the southeast asia there is this uh, pdpa there is personal data privacy act which is um, i wouldn't say <coughs> something on the lines of uh, gdpr if i can say that is there it's widely accepted by many companies like uh, by different versions of it like there's malaysia is there there is thailand is there, there are many countries vietnam and all coming up with the uh, act on the similar lines so uh, people requested, our uh, viewers requested for a webinar on those lines. So here I am with an approach to PDPA. Even if you are not doing PDPA, uh, you can always uh, you know, view it for the sake of the knowledge base and uh, what is happening around the, around the world. So uh, here we go. So again, uh, the agenda is the same as to what was shared with you earlier, that is, uh, background data compliance in Singapore, background and history, step-by-step -step approach, do's and don'ts, checklists and timelines, and then finally, why are companies doing it and how it is going to help your company. Now, many of these points will be overlapping as I go through it. I'm not really following a linear approach on this webinar, rather almost all my webinars. So, <clears throat> hope this thing helps out. And here is our YouTube channel, um, youtube.com slash C Vista InfoSec official. There are, we have dozens and dozens of videos on, again, all of them free, PCI DSS, SOC2, HIPAA, GDPR, ethical hacking, PDPA, NIST guidelines, you name it, we are there. And uh, many of uh, like business continuities there, DLP is there, so many uh, areas you covered from compliance perspective over the years. So please do, um, you can uh, sign up, you can subscribe to it and you'll get informed because we are uploading uh, many, a lot of content on a very regular basis. So you can get updated on uh, a regular basis on that. And just to let you know, we are, uh, since we get a huge amount of uh, questions during our webinars and many of them are extremely interesting. So what you're doing is going maybe next month, we are starting all a five minute series video so in that case, uh, you know, we'll cover up um, maybe one question that is something like, is, uh, uh, is PCI DSS uh, like a QSA audit and on-site or can it be done remotely? Or what is the frequency of doing an ASV and who can do it? Like those frequently asked questions. So SOC2 uh, or on GDPR, what is the compliance ratio, how it can be done? Um, uh, many areas that people have got stumped on. So we'll be covering that in those five minute videos. So wish us luck on that and do subscribe so you get notified when those videos get uploaded. So again, uh, for the key to our session is always a question. So do drop in your question um, on this uh, go to webinar. There's a questions tab. You can type in a question and I'll take it up immediately. <coughs> and if it is too much, then perhaps I might push it. Okay, I'm running a slight cough. So <coughs> Please excuse me on that. One second, on. Okay, I'm back, and hopefully, I won't cough anymore until the session is over, at least. So this is putting a face to the voice. This is me. I got my company Vista InfoSec. We are now there in the US. When we just started in Singapore, that's how this request for PDPA came up because in Southeast Asia, PDPA is a big deal. So um, we are there in the US, we are there in Singapore. We just come up in Canada too. And I have been there in this industry for more than 25 years now. I'm basically on the compliance side, not on the VAPT or the ethical hacking front. Um, these are a few of our services. Don't worry, this is the last slide on my company and we jump right into the content. So we're there in compliance, we're there in risk and security, web AppSec, VAPT, social engineering, SCADA risk, uh, 
we do a lot of specialized assessments on uh, WAF, SIEM, IBS, BAM, WEBS. We even help in the design and uh, not the implementation, but at least in the design and advisory of critical infrastructure. We are also a PCI DSS certifying body, by the way. And we have our own CPA in the US, so we also do SOC 2, uh, SOC 1, SOC 3. We are there on HIPAA, GDPR, uh, uh, through our US office, that is. And last but not the least, we have an online training module, Academia Compliance. You can look up academiacompliance.com. So background to PDPA, just a quick background to what's happening. So data, data in today's world, as we can see, the Cambridge Analytica fiasco and Facebook and stuff, and everybody is getting, and even Google getting uh, penalized left, right, and center. So data is the most important thing, not more than gold. It's a data mine, which holds a wealth of information through which a lot of money can be made. Uh, decisions can be skewed, countries can be changed. So there are many things that's happening. So the uh, critical thing as on date is data. And this is the new European Commission, Consumer Commissioner. Personal data is the new oil of the internet and the new currency of the digital world. Many people think that it is Mukesh Ambani who said this first, but it is actually Magalena Koneva who said this thing. Personal data is the new oil of the internet and the new currency of the digital world. So that's where it is. All your customers are sitting on, online. If you're able to track what they're doing, how they're doing, what they're doing, you'll be able to really notch a few billion dollars on your top line. So <clears throat> personal data is basically any information and commercial transaction that can identify a person. It could be uh, your identification number, your name, email address, image, which is your uh, image uh, doesn't necessarily mean your photograph. It can also be a photograph in which you are there. And again, your home address, telephone number, passport number, all this comes as a part of your personal data. Now, if you look at GDPR, it goes a lot more than that. Um, now, this is just, just to give you an idea as to how uh, this is so important, especially in Southeast Asia. There are 2.24.1 million internet users just in Malaysia, and the Malaysian servers are the 10th most in demand servers globally. And 18 million Facebook users are in Malaysia itself. So imagine the amount of data and imagine the amount of traction that can be had. Now, with regards to data, data never dies. It can, you can purge it from a particular site, but if somebody's made a copy of it somewhere else, there's nothing that you can do about it. So the only thing that you, you live once, but the data is forever. And if somebody's got a way to tap into it, to store it, to make whatever changes or to milk it for personal grain, um, there's a lot that can be achieved. So why PDPA? So um, as I don't think I need to mention this, but Singapore is coming is uh, over the years. It is the number one site for businesses, the number one country for businesses across the world, not the US, not China, not uh, Hong Kong or whatever be the case. It is Singapore. And as far as Southeast Asia is concerned, Singapore sets the tone for the entire Southeast Asia. So if Singapore does it, everybody else does it. So, so if you are facilitating trade across the world for e-commerce or FDI, uh, <coughs> you need to have some sort of a law in place to protect the rights of your data subjects. And that's where PDPA has come into place. Now, identity theft and data is a massive deal across the world. Now, um, if you are in India, so many people in India don't even understand what is meant by identity theft. So I, I remember a, a, a minister even saying that, okay, you have my uh, personal details. What can you do with it? You can do nothing with it. So, uh, but uh, fortunately, that's not the definition with which the uh, world understands privacy or identity. So it is very important that your name, birthday, telephone number, credit card numbers uh, are protected. Even your, uh, you know, spiritual in the even spirituality your sexual orientation all those things is very personal private information which needs to be protected and can be misused um, to commit fraud or other crimes uh, like uh, there are so many instances coming up where entire identities of people are taken up and somebody else x person is behaving as somebody else online that is person y so data, this is uh, gives you a good synopsis of what is happening across the world. And so as far as comprehensive data loss is concerned, you can see that in the dark blue color and there is enacted pending effort, which includes India, 
and other parts of South America, and even parts of Africa. And there are so many places where there is absolutely, including China, which the, in which there is absolutely no law to uh, protect um, data protection laws, uh, to protect data uh, in their or in their countries. So India again, they have come up with a law, but it's awaiting uh, once the rigmarole of the politic, uh, political antics are over, hopefully the lawmakers would get down to creating something. So uh, overview to what is uh, the PDPA all about. Uh, the Singapore's Personal Data, uh, Data Protection Act was enacted in November 2012. Uh, and then the uh, law actually came into, uh, into operation on the 2nd of Jan 2013. They had very, very strict provisions with penalties for there is something called as a DNC data do, do not call and there's data provision uh, data protection provisions DPP that came, that came into effect by uh, 2nd July 2014 the PDPC which is something like the uh, ICO information commissioner's officer that you see in uh, uh, Europe so for GDPR here we have the PDPC there is personal data Protection Commission. It was formed again on the same day that the act came into operation, that is 2nd of Jan 2013. And then again, the advisory committee was formed to advise the PDPC of how the law can be enhanced or it needs to be modified or look into individual instances of uh, any sort of breaches. So, objective of the regime was again individual interest and economic interest. <coughs> Individual interests again to protect individual laws, individual data from misuse by um, regulating proper management of personal data, and then give same like GDPR, give individual greater control of their personal data. Now, in case you have not had any idea about GDPR or suggest you to have it, uh, uh, if you go to YouTube and search for our YouTube channel Vista Infosec Official, and then go to the playlist of GDPR. There are many videos on just what is GDPR and how it, uh, how it can help you, how to roll it out, um, you know, um, <coughs> do's and don'ts, audit areas, all those things are covered over there. So that will give you a good idea of how even PDPA works. Now, economic interest again played a huge role in ensuring that PDPA got rolled out in a very, very snappy way. And that is, <coughs> um, Singapore is looked at the go-to destination for businesses across the world. So unless the economic interest of those companies are protected uh, unless those companies which are coming out of Europe or Asia have the uh, peace that is their data is safe and the country is taking uh, data privacy very very seriously they would think twice before coming so that's where again the issue of economic interest um, ensuring that the data protection regime falls into place becomes extremely important now <clears throat> The approach for the data protection regime, again, to one is to protect individual personal data. And as I said earlier, help businesses gain consumer confidence through the proper handling of personal data. Like, uh, you know, so many times you've seen that uh, there is this particular, you know, uh, energy company who is supplying electricity uh, to the state or to the city. And then that company sets up like a mutual fund business or like a, you know, loan consumer business. And suddenly um, all their, what to say uh, customers suddenly get calls um, to buy mutual fund to take a loan and stuff like that so that is really misusing of customer data but when such a law is in place uh, like a pdpa that is there it helps a consumer the businesses to get consumer confidence that is your data will not be misused and when you want you can take it out or you can get it modified or know what we are storing and what not is storing now keep compliance cost manageable. Now uh, for those who are with uh, looking into GDPR, you know that the cost of compliance is seriously very high. So here they are looking at also ensuring that the compliance cost is very manageable. And then take into account the international standards to enhance Singapore's status as a trusted hub for data management and data processing activities. So here it is also a major issue with regards to uh, the international standards. So if there is a UK company or there is a company based in the US that wants to come and work in Singapore or in the Southeast Asia, they need to be ensured, they need to be assured that uh, whatever data is there is being held in the right sanctity and sanitized in the right way. 
so overall it is a technology neutral uh, uh, regime it's a principles based regime to ensure that the right objectives are achieved and uh, at the same time ensuring that uh, you know no specific technology is touted or no specific technologies are enforced on the people so individuals to be aware uh, um, they have to be made aware and have consented to the data activities so there is a notification obligation same which is there under uh, gdpr there is a consent obligation to ensure that uh, com uh, companies have taken the right consent from the people for collecting the data and people are aware as to what that purpose is for uh, the collection of data and what are their rights and how they can ensure that the data is not getting misused so all those uh, what to say uh, base ethics are there in place again it is very strongly from gdpr and again there's a principles based obligation so organizations have the obligation to take care for personal data so there is an accuracy obligation there's a protection obligation retention limitation to ensure that okay it is retained only for a specific period of time and there's this transfer limitation that is one it cannot be misused uh, that is in uh, company x cannot just transfer it to company y without the permission explicit permission of the data uh, subject and at the same time to transfer the data to the person to the data subject in case they ask for the data so that's where the access and correction obligation comes into place the openness obligation comes into place to ensure the uh, accountability and challenging the compliance and that is uh, if my data is, is stored by any of singaporean companies uh, i should be in a position to challenge them and ask them that uh, prove it to me that you're not misusing my, my my data that is stored with you. So that's a huge thing that is happening. Now, what companies are covered under this thing? There is organizations engaged in data activities within Singapore are covered by default. And the, all the data intermediaries, that is all the service based organizations are also covered. So <clears throat> there's a protection and limitation and retention limitation is there. Uh, there is a relevant sectoral legislation. What I mean by that is uh, the BFSI uh, or the banking sector has got much more stringent liabilities, much more stringent, um, you know, requirements also with regards to um, handling their customer data, client data, and the, then of course there is the public agencies and agents, then individuals acting in a personal or domestic capacity as an individual. So even those uh, areas are covered. That is individuals when they are employees and how the data is managed. For the public agencies, there are internal government rules, uh, government rules, and for employees, there are other relevant organization uh, legislation. So that is not really covered under the PDPA. PDPA basically, as you can see, is on the law, is on the left law, is on the left side. That is for organizations engaged in data activities within Singapore. Now, what are the key features of PDPA? This will be very interesting. And if you have a background on GDPR, you'll really find this very interesting. Um, first and first is the definition. That is personal data refers to data about an individual who can be identified from the data or from the data and other info that the organization has or is likely to have access to. So in that, in that case, even if a data, a data point or a database or some data which doesn't contain my name doesn't mean it's not covered under PDP. It could be my address uh, uh, with there is somebody so somebody can put the address in, identify who are living over there and identify that this data is about me. So it is covered under personal data. What about deceased individuals? only disclosure and safeguarding rules apply and protection for up to 10 years after that but in case there is a will then the individuals can even ask for the data to be removed or to be downloaded to their system it covers electronic and non-electronic data <coughs> just blindly protection of personal data regardless whether data is true or false so no company has a leeway of saying that okay we had no way of ensuring or checking whether data is true or not so we did not apply the right control. So all those, um, you know, excuses are no longer admissible. There's something called as a business contact information. Uh, the PDPA does not cover business contact information. So many, many people ask us, um, that is, 
if I am storing maybe the director's name, number and address of an X company, which is a client of mine, do I need to have a consent form signed off? Well, that's not the case. It's not really required. For business contact information, PDPA does not apply. Um, that said, going ahead, organizations, what is meant by an organization? So it is, includes any individual company, association, bodies or persons which is formed under the law of Singapore. Now this thing is very important for us because we just got formulated in Singapore like a month back. And things are looking pretty good actually because PDPA is a really big deal over there. There's even an IRM, there's another law over there for risk management. So there are many things that we're doing over there. Now the PDPA, okay, uh, uh, there, they have given an organ a definition of an organization as an individual company, association or bodies, uh, resident or having an office place in Singapore. It does not cover any individual acting in a personal capacity. So if I am doing like I am storing the name number of um, you know whatever friends I have or whatever contacts I have in my phone, uh, I need not be getting consent from them. This is again, you know, a gray area that many people ask us. So let me give the answer up front. Any employee acting in the course of his employment with any with an organization it doesn't cover because uh, that will be they get covered under a BCI business contact information. Uh, any public agency or organization in the course of acting on behalf of an agency in relation to the collection use or in other words, any sort of government bodies are excluded. Uh, from the definition of organization as you might remember over here we had seen that the right side public agencies and individuals acting in personal capacity is not covered under PDPA there's something called as a data intermediary an organization which processes personal data on behalf of another organization but does not include an employee of that other organization so in that case, data intermediaries are also covered. So in short, if I might uh, give it on the name, data intermediaries are also, uh, you can call them as a service organization. So there is a data custodian is there and there's a data processor. So th this becomes like a data processor if you look at it from the uh, GDPR perspective. And so they are looking at various processes like recording, holding, adaptation, alteration, retrieval, MIS activities, any sort of transmission, erasure, destruction. So even those companies who, who are uh, providing the service of uh, <coughs> data destruction and disposal come under it. So as far as uh, data intermediary is concerned, only the protection obligation and the retention limitation obligation comes into place. But if you're wondering what, what this is all about, in the previous slide I had covered it, let me quickly jump over there to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. This one. So uh, for a data intermediary, only the protection, that is a, you know, this protection over here, protection obligation and the retention limitation obligation comes into place not a transfer or the accuracy obligation or the access or correction or openness comes into place that will be by the data owners who is there for the data intermediary only the ensuring that the data is accurately protected and retained for only as long as authorized so these are the two uh, obligations which are there for uh, <coughs> data intermediary and there's a do not call registry so over here it is covered B2C marketing, so somebody calling for take my loan or take a insurance from me or take a mutual fund from me, all those things covers over there. Offer to supply, advertise or promote goods or services and promote land interest in land, business, investment opportunities and all B2C business to end user, end customer is covered under the DNC. What is not included is a B2B marketing. You understand what is B2B marketing? So my, in my, my individual uh, you know personal sitting in this office personal my my colleague in marketing writing about about our services or sending cold emails to some company in Singapore about our services is not covered under the do not call registry 
what is not covered is also personal calls and SMSs. So, uh, <laughs> my, uh, so let's assume your ex-girlfriend has uh, banned you from calling her. She cannot put her name in the do not call registry and then insist that you follow the do not call registry because your name is over there. Her name is over there. So all those things are not there. Markets, research, surveys, any sort of messages by the government, again, are for non-commercial programs are again not included in scope. What is again not included in the scope? Included in the scope, voice calls again for the B2C, SMS, fax, sent to Singapore, <coughs> phone numbers, it's allowed, it's not allowed. Uh, and uh, that means it's in the scope of uh, the DNC registry. Now, message that can be sent without the use of phone numbers, example, is cell broadcast. So you're spamming out, so uh, to your whatever is there, like, um, you get this listed unlisted numbers and you're uh, reaching out to them directly so those come under it uh, there's a uh, organization key obligations organizations key obligations under the dnc do not call registry check and, and uh, check against the dnc within 30 days before doing marketing 60 days in the first six months unless they have clear unambiguous consent in evidential form and display their id contact info and originating numbers so no more masking numbers is allowed so no more bouncing your call via skype and so it is not visible to the other person who is receiving the call all those things are not uh, allowed at all and okay there is a nice question that is coming uh, miss usha thank you for the question she is asking uh, is access to the dnc do not call registry free of cost or is it uh, to be paid am i right yes okay so this uh, Access to the DNC is not free. There is there is something like a prepaid and a postpaid mode. Uh, they can uh, they have to pay some amount to access the DNC to check uh, <coughs> whether the numbers they are contacting is a part of the DNC. Do not call registry or not. <coughs> so this is how it is. It is there uh, in India. We have something called the DND that is do not disturb. So for the individual registers, the number of the DNC, number is added to the DNC and remain number remains the DST, the DNC unless the individual deregisters or terminates the service, the registration in itself doesn't expire. So there are three separate registers. There is a voice a register or DNC register for voice calls, DNC register for text messages, and DNC register for fax messages. And the registry can be done online via the DNC site, SMS or IVRS, what is there. And it takes uh, at least two, one to two months before the uh, you know, system can be made active for a particular number. Same thing that we see even in India. And here it is. For, um, since Usha, you asked me for it, here it is. So organization can apply for an account if they need to check for the DNC registry. This organization submit the list of numbers to the DNC. The DNC register checks through the list and then lets them know whether it is, uh, you know, uh, which numbers are in the DNC and which numbers are not in the DNC. They can uh, set up main account, sub accounts, and pay a fee for each account. Um, there are some free credits and all, but that typically is not enough. So, but still, it, I appreciate the Singaporean government making the uh, provision for such a thing as this and there are tiered fees based on the number of uh, accounts you will be filtering via the DNC so there is bulk filtering all those things so uh, okay there is a nice okay Alan okay he's asking how does the DNC work what do you mean by that okay so what he is essentially saying is that do the people get access to the DNC or they are supposed to be doing it in some other way. So do they get access to the millions of uh, IDs in the DNC against which they need to check, companies need to check whether their numbers is in the DNC or not? Well, that doesn't work that way because in that case, the government would have violated its own precepts and principles because somebody can just simply download the entire DNC registry and then misuse it. So what happens is that typically, uh, typically over here, you upload maybe an Excel file or a CSV file containing all the data that you want checked, the numbers that you want checked. The DNC registry, they have got their own application, it checks against this database and then returns which numbers are a part of the DNC and which numbers are not a part of the DNC. 
and uh, for which number of voice calls allowed, for which only uh, fax messages are allowed, and for which only text messages are allowed. So all that granularity you get, but nobody gets access directly to the DNC registry for doing whatever checks or whatever you are doing. Uh, so again, there are some exemptions over here that is um, uh, for uh, you know getting into the DNC or not. Uh, one sec, please. As is very obvious, uh, if a particular X person has a, an ongoing business relationship, so in that case, the company did not check the DNC whether the uh, client is listed in the DNC or not. For example, I have a bank account with the Bank of Singapore, and uh, whenever there is a deposit or a credit or a debit in my account, or there is some issues with the account, I get a message from the bank as to what is going on so the bank did not check with the dmc to check whether my number is listed over there or not and what we simply need to do is that uh, just continue sending based on my client profile because these uh, ongoing relationship messages are exempted from uh, uh, any sort of dmc validation so that said uh, there are uh, messages related to ongoing uh, ongoing relationships are not really required to be um, validated via the DNC registry and there's an opt-out facility same mode once opted out <coughs> no message exam messages can be sent to the same number after 30 days 30 to 60 days once it is there in place now in this case also there is a top writer that, that is uh, I have not withdrawn consent from the bank saying that you need not be uh, contacting me again for any sort of this FYI messages. Ongoing relationship, what it is and what it is not, because this is again a very hazy area. Ongoing relationship examples would be membership and subscription. Um, not ongoing relationship would be a one-time transaction. So um, maybe I call a salesman to inquire about a property. That doesn't mean that I have an ongoing relationship and he can pass on my number to anybody or do uh, you know start calling me or start sending me messages or made a reservation and left his number so that's like uh, maybe a, i go to a doctor or I go to uh, an advisory system and make an appointment and left my leave my number that's like a one time thing unless there's a recurring uh, business that is there in place like i'm a member of a club or i have uh, subscribed to a magazine or stuff like that until that is there, it doesn't really qualify as an ongoing relationship. Ongoing relationship, like the telco reminds you to top up your prepaid card. These things are allowed. Credit card informing you that, uh, that uh, you know um, you can enjoy some additional discounts, or you have hit the top limit, or you are your payments are pending. So those things are allowed. But let's assume, as I gave the example earlier. The credit card company starts a new business, maybe into property development or maybe into mutual fund or insurance. And uh, they cannot then use this exemption because maybe the company name is the same. <coughs> Sorry for that. Maybe there's this company ABCL, all right, just cooking up a name or Acme. Acme credit card company. And Acme, I have my credit card from Acme company, and then um, they also launch Acme mutual fund, Acme insurance. So company is the same, but they cannot uh, qualify or quantify my existing credit card relationship with them and start sending me messages. That will be a misuse. That's what I had mentioned earlier. This is extremely important because in many countries, including in India, there are so many uh, garbage messages that covered because because of the misuse of uh, you know data that is floating across the enterprise across organizations where they cross use misuse um, you know individual contact information 
Now, with the exemption, generally there are two options for consumers with the DNC. They can uh, register that okay, they don't wish to receive any messages from banks or from insurance companies, or they can say I I only want to receive messages from uh, you know a bank, not from a telecom, not from an insurance provider, not from a property provider, nothing. I just want to have bank related messages so i can have this granularity built into my exemptions given or my sign up uh, you know with the dnc do not call registry now penalty and enforcement regi regime the data protection commission which is there at the top penalties are uh, up to 1 million dollars and for dnc it is capped per contravention is capped at 10000 dollars and composition capped at $1,000 each. So composition would be like maybe um, I've misused it over a period of time across hundreds of users. So for a composition, it cannot go beyond $1,000 multiplied by whatever the number of people. And under the Data Provis uh, Pro uh, Provision Act, uh, Data Protection Act, uh, individual can seek um, redress via civil proceedings. They can appeal before an appellate, uh, independent appellate committee to hear their appeals and to the courts uh, uh, when they feel that their rights have been infringed upon. Three considerations for organization, treatment for existing data, ensure the collection, that is new rules apply uh, to collection activities after the law is in effect, not before that. It will, uh, uh, prior to 2014, if the data is there, you need not be worried about that. This is also a key requirement or key issue under GDPR that people are working, wondering as to what about the past data that I have where I might not be having an explicit consent in place with me. Here they have made it clear that collection uh, obligation applies only past uh, the enforcement of the standard. The existing can be used reasonably existing users without fresh consent. For, but for new uh, uh, privacy related data, the PD, uh, you need to have consent in place. <coughs> And again, organization needs to obtain consent for disclosure and access and correction care. All new reply applies to all the data. So even though I might not be having consent for data collect collected prior to 2014, but the access, correction, and care applies to all the data, regardless of when the data was collected. And the next steps again, the PDPA gazetted in 2012 comes into effect, came into effect on 2014. And the rest of PDPA came into effect on uh, from the 2nd July 2014. The only the DNC came into effect from 2nd Jan 2014. So most importantly, if you are coming under it, you need to take stock of your organization's PDI, personal data inventory. Very important. I, again, the steps are the same. If you need more information, again, I would really request you to look up our YouTube channel, search for Vista InfoSec Official. Go to the GDPR playlist and there you will see many videos with which will help you even understand PDPA better. Apply a DPO, implement a DPP. So again, DPO, a data protection officer, again, uh, comes under requirement for GDPR also. So you need to have this, again, assuming that your organization is good enough. And there is a ton of information which is there um, on this pdpc.government site, or of the act, FAQs, business checklists, advisory guidelines, regulation, That's they have PDP workshop, they have a DNC briefing, PDP briefing. Everything is there. They have provided a ton of information. So it, it's not clouded under uh, uh, cover of haziness, but here there's a ton of information that's been provided. Now there is, again, as I said, uh, for the help of the organization on this website, if you go pdpc.gov.sg, there's a PDPA briefing, one to two hour briefing is there. The DNC, one to two hour briefing is there online. They have PDP workshop, which is there, one day workshop that they organize. Now, one question that is asked uh, by the people who had asked me for this webinar was differences between Singapore and Malaysian PDPA. Sensitive personal data is defined in Malaysian Act, but not in Singapore Act. The Malaysian PDPA does not require the appointment of a DPO, unlike the Singapore PDPA, as you saw earlier, requires a DPO to be in place, so it's a data protection officer. In Malaysian PDPA, there is no way or no provision for a data subject to seek compensation or damages under the Act. But the Singaporean PDPA, the data subject can go to the court for injunction or damages in case they feel they have been wronged. 
So again, any sort of questions that brings me to the end, do drop in a line. I'll give you the details as you go ahead. These are our past webinars that has been there. As you can see, there is a ton of information which is there online in our YouTube channel. And this is your current webinar, the 29th webinar that is doing step-by-step -step approach to uh, PDPA compliance. There's a lot of information which is there on our YouTube channel. This is just a compliance webinar. There is others in ethical hacking and stuff that is there. Now, what I request you to do is at the end of this webinar, there's a free survey. Please ensure you, uh, I request you rather, to fill it up. We spend a lot of time and money to get this uh, information out to you at no cost. Uh, I'd really love to hear what your thoughts are. And most importantly, do let me know what other subjects that you want me to cover. And we do take into consideration. If you have any queries, do drop in a line. I will reply to you. So again, thank you so much for your time. Please do complete a brief survey at the end. That's our YouTube channel uh, that you can uh, click on. Again, I said this earlier. That's our Facebook. We keep uploading lots of information on our Facebook page. So do share, like the page and our official page on linkedin is also there we keep on uploading quite a few articles quite a few um, you know videos online so do follow the page and you'll get, get access to that these are my coordinates you can drop me a line anytime and we'll be more than happy to reply to you so until next time thank you and have a wonderful day ahead bye bye